Hey, Rocky Fork, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will stay connected by downloading our app. Good morning. I may sound a little different because I'm breathing through one nostril. <clears throat> I'm hoping this morning's message, I have the proper ingredients of cold medicine, coffee, hoping that balance just kind of fires off here in a minute. I've been kind of distant today since I have a cold, so just wanted to... Uh, uh, not uh, share that with all of you <laughs> as you came in. So, uh, so glad you're here. Thrilled that you're here. We're wrapping up our sermon series, just like John said, uh, on the series on worldviews. We've been talking about all these different perspectives and how we see the world, worldviews. Uh, James Sire said it this way. Let's go ahead and see his quote. He says, A worldview is a commitment a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed in a story or a set of presuppositions, assumptions, which may be true, partially true, or entirely false, that we hold consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently, about the basic constitution of reality that provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being. Now, Dr. Sire is an incredibly smart man, uses big words. The idea behind that is that every one of us has a worldview, whether we know it or not. And just to be clear what a worldview is, let's go ahead and show our graphic again from last week. The idea is, as you know, uh, many of you like bullseyes, right, targets. You always aim for the center, right? Starting in the center, we would work out. We want to establish a worldview that is real, based on truth, right? Beliefs that we hold. The next part would be values based on those truths. That's going to dictate what we see is good, right? Virtuous, what is important. And lastly, what we see is behaviors. That's how we're going to act and what we're going to do based on our worldview. How many people would agree that's what a worldview looks like? I mean, in a basic concept, the what I believe eventually drives the what I do, right? Yeah. Now, what happens so often is the, the, the what I believe and the what I do are not based on any truth whatsoever. And we see this in, in reality in our world, don't we? People are doing things that we would go, why are you doing that? Why is that happening? So let me ask this question. And it's a really personal question. It's one that you have to answer yourself. Are my beliefs, my worldview, is it based on feelings, emotions, cultural norms or swings, or prevailing trends in society? Or is it based on truth? And not your truth or my truth, but the truth. Right? There's a difference, right? Is it based on what God's Word says? Here's what I would say. Here, here, here it all is, in, in just, it, just putting it all in a nice, neat little package, okay? If what you believe is not in Scripture... You do not have a Christ-centered worldview. I'm done. Right? I mean, that's what we've been talking about all along. Where is our worldview established? What it was established upon? Where do we find truth and base our life and our worldview around that? There are all sorts of worldviews, but... As followers of Christ, doesn't it make sense that we would pursue a worldview on, upon which He is the truth, right? And that we find truth in Him, in His teachings, and the evidence of His resurrection and His life lived out in Scripture. Now last week I gave you two of four pillars, four, of four corners, right, of, of a Christian worldview. 
Bonus points for anybody who could tell me what the first one is. There you go. One of our elders. All right, paying attention. God is the creator. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God. I could stop there, right? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. This bold truth provides evidence that only God could create the splendor and the majesty of our creation. The Bible gives us a plausible answer for creation. God spoke it into existence. He didn't have to go to Lowe's or Home Depot and gather up all the materials, right? He didn't have to wait to Black Friday or Cyber Monday in order to order stuff and get it in, right? He created, he spoke it into existence. Out of nothingness is what the Hebrew scripture would say. Out of next ex neho, out of nothing, spoke it into existence. But there is a God and he is a creator. The second one is this, of our Christian foundation. The fall. The fall. When God created, he saw that it was good. Right? He said it six times. Almost like, wow, man, look at that. That's good. And then when he created Adam and Eve, he said, it is very good. Right? Yeah. So many people look at the story of Adam and Eve and we think, well, it's, it's an accident, right? It's an innocent moment, right? They made a mistake, right? They, they ate of the fruit in the garden. They didn't know. Yes, they did know. And it's not an accident. It wasn't a weak moment in their lives. It was a moment where they decided, I want to be like God. I want to be on equal plane with God. And as we talked about, many of our world, our worldviews that we see that sneak up on us, that what they do is they dethrone God first and then they move self onto that throne. That's what Adam and Eve are doing. Because the serpent said, hey, God doesn't want you to eat from that apple. He doesn't want you to eat that fruit. Because then you'll be like him and you'll have knowledge of good and evil. The problem's not the fruit. The problem is their pride. They want the very thing that they can't have. They want to be God. They want to elevate self above Him. The fall uh, happens, God's perfect creation, and it introduces this, uh, this punishment of sin and the impact it has on us every day of our lives. Sin has this snowball effect. It has corrupted everything. A disease and distrust and sorrow and death, disasters and murder, adultery, broken relationships all come from the curse of sin. As tragic as the fall is, it does provide us with real, tangible answers as to why this world is a mess, doesn't it? Right? I mean, if we were to say, well, God created, right, and then we wouldn't say anything else, we'd have some question like, well, how, if, if God created and it was very good, how did we get to this place? Because it's not very good, right? Right? You see how we're chaining this together, how these links are kind of coming together? The fall caused the fall of creation, and death and sin entered into the world. And it's with this understanding that we have, we can now answer some difficult questions like, why does bad stuff happen to good people and bad people? Why in the world is the world getting Worse and not better. 
I believe, creation, right? Creation, sin. And the farther we get away from that sin, that original, that, that, that first sin, and, and the, all the multiple sins that follow, the worse it gets. Does that make sense to you? It never gets better. It only gets worse because there is sin in the world. Someday it would be better, but not now. Why, why does everything die? Plants, humans, animals? You have an answer for that? It wasn't God's first creation. It wasn't what he intended. It's because sin entered the world. Because of sin, death also entered the world. And now you have an answer. Because of sin, there is death. The fall gives us real, believable answers to the reality of our current world situation. And only the truth found in God's Word is capable of explaining why the world is broken and how it was created to begin with. Only a Christ-centered worldview offers the truth about sin and the deadly effects upon the world. You could search out all other worldviews, and none of them are going to talk about how things are getting worse, and how sin came into the world. I challenge you. They don't have an answer. So how's that for a recap? All right, you ready for the other two? This is what you came for, right? Come on. You want it? I don't think you're ready. Okay, here's the new stuff third piece of this foundation. God is faithful in keeping his promises. This is important, not only in the past, but in the future. Not only in the past and the future, but in the present. This is important. God is faithful in keeping his promises. So often we look at the Old Testament and we say, man, God was harsh, right? I smite thee, right? Poof. People are gone, right? Wipes out entire cities. And there are times when we read the Old Testament, it feels like God has had enough and he's ready to, to erase all of mankind. That actually comes to a point. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth. <laughs> He's at this moment, he's like, all right, you are on my last nerve. Don't make me stop the car. Right? And that every inclination of thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. To a point where you've just worried him so much and you've gotten to a place where he's like, all right, I've had enough. I'm going to, i got to do something. It is no longer good. It's bad. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I created and with, all the, with them, the, uh, the animals, the birds, and all the creation to move along the ground. For I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor, one person. So often scriptures are like that, right? So there's these moments where, uh, it, it, much like a, a, a track or a Uh, like you've seen in a graph, like the graphs kind of intersect, and so often it gets down to one person or one family or one situation where everything is kind of drawn through this thin red line, right? Everything's kind of drawn through this moment that runs through history, right? And this is one of those moments where, where God says, everybody is bad except for Noah, A lot of people are skeptical of the story of Noah, right? Did that really happen? I mean, come on, that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty crazy story, right? 
guy builds a boat. Him and his family get on it. Everybody in the world dies. He's the only one that survives. That's kind of crazy, right? Did you know? Every known civilization in the world has a flood story. Every civilization has a flood story. The names may be different, but the how and the what took place are the same. 200 different cultures have a flood story. Does that sound... Is, is, does that bring a little bit of evidence to the, to, the, to, the, to the forefront where you kind of say, well, okay, so it's a crazy story, but why do all these other cultures have the same story? Was somebody walking around saying, hey, it's going to be a flood story. Hang on to it. Hey, go tell your neighbors. And then you go to the next people and say, hey, there's going to be this guy Noah, and it's going to happen, and, and you guys lie about it too, Okay. And just keep going, right? It's not what happened. Every culture has a flood story because it happened. God floods the earth and saves Noah and his family. And once Noah and his family have landed on dry land safely, God establishes a new covenant with them. A covenant is a promise. It's an agreement between two parties. When it's a covenant with God, God is the one who is providing everything. Genesis chapter 9 verse 11 says this, I, God speaks and he says, I will establish my covenant with you talking to Noah. Never again will all of life be destroyed by waters of the flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Genesis 9 13, I have set my rainbow in the clouds... And it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. <laughs> How many people are old enough to remember? It's a double rainbow, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many people are mesmerized every time you see a rainbow? Right? You're like, wow, how... I I know how that, how that happens or, you know, I'm trying to drive to the end of it, right, to find the pot of gold, you know, you know all those things, right? Or, or when the rainbow is right over grandma's house or it ends at grandma's house, it's, that was always something, right? But God is saying that is a sign of a covenant that I will no longer flood the earth. Did you know that? Did you know where it was in Scripture? Okay. Now you have an anchor point. Okay? This covenant isn't just a promise not to flood the earth again. It's a promise that God is going to reestablish a relationship with His people. Right? If I'm not going to flood the earth and I'm not going to wipe you all out again, then I, we need to have a relationship, right? We need to, we need to figure this out and, and work through it. And throughout the Old Testament, there are highs and lows in the relationship with God. And if you've ever read the Old Testament, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That good king, bad king, you know, in and out, right? And, and they're with God, they're not with God, and, and all these things, right? They're in and out. And at one point, the whole nation, of the Jewish nation, is bound up in slavery in Egypt. There are disasters, there's wars, there's good kings, there's bad kings, there's invaders from other nations, there's famines, there's a split in the nation of Israel itself, the north and the south, with two separate kings. There's idol worship, there's murder, there's adultery, and through all the ups and downs, God, pervert, per, God preserves and protects His people, keeping the covenant, always looking for the relationship. And at countless points in the Old Testament, God steps in and blesses the faithful. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Caleb, 
David and all the prophets, all of them by faith were promised something greater than they could ever imagine or even dream of. That something amazing was coming. And that amazing person is Jesus. He would be the very person that would bind the new covenant, the relationship. They knew and they believed that God was faithful in keeping his promises. Listen, this is where all the Old Testament stories intersect with us. So often when we look at those, we thought those were old stories, right? And, and those people, they, they spoke a funny language, they wore funny clothes, and that was a long time ago, and I don't really think we have anything in common with them. Not true. Because our relationship goes much like theirs with God, right? It might, it might speak in the truth. It may have been a long time ago, and it may have been at a different age, and it may be in a different book, but we are worshiping and following the same God. I love what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. I'm only going to read a piece of it. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some count slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Man, does that do something for you? God is is not slow in keeping his promises. He's not lacking. He's not uh, dragging his feet. He's not forgotten. All those adjectives or, or things that describe that, right? Instead, he's patient. I don't know about you, but I was in my mid-30s before I came to Christ. Thank God he's patient, right? And I don't know where you're sitting at this morning in your relationship with God. Through the depth and the level of, of the promises that God has given us. We can learn a lot from the folks in the Old Testament, those believers, because God holds up his end of the promise every single time. When God makes a promise, it will happen. Maybe not in your lifetime, maybe not when you want it to happen, but it will happen. God's promises always happen. And these fulfilled promises are proof that that we can be confident and trust God. They they are there for a reason, right? They're they're there. It's the moment where we go, okay, there's the evidence, right? There it is. God spoke it and it happened. For example, Genesis chapter 3. This is often talked to as the pre-gospel. Genesis chapter 3, there's a preview of what's going to happen between Jesus and Satan. It's, it's It's a rescue mission because of the fall and the sin that entered the world. God is telling Satan in this moment, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, he says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. That there'll, there'll be a struggle. You won't be friends. You'll be enemies. Between your offspring and hers. And he uh, is capitalized, meaning divine. It means he, Jesus, will crush your head, Satan. And, and you will strike his heel. Now, let me just kind of bring to, to, to bear the, the, the context, okay? Uh, when you strike somebody's heel in the Old Testament or in the speaking, you, it's not a death blow, right? It's a ow, okay? Like this morning, I opened uh, the drawers in my, in my uh, 
bathroom, I'm shaving, I'm getting ready, and, and I thought, Mark, don't leave those drawers open. And I did. And then when I turned, I smacked my knee, and it still hurts right now, right? But it wasn't, I, I wasn't going to die. I didn't call 911, right? I'm not that dramatic. I've got a cold, now I might be dying, but, right? Because that's guys, right? But what he's saying is, Jesus is going to crush your skull, but you're only going to inflict, uh, oh, you're there, moment on him. And that God's going to use that for a great victory. In other words, Jesus is going to destroy Satan and the devil's attempt to kill Jesus will lead to mankind's greatest victory when Jesus walks out of the grave. You see, what Satan intended for evil, God uses for good. Another promise in the Old Testament is from a preacher named Isaiah, 744 years before Jesus is ever born. Isaiah would say this, and, and we're approaching Christmas, so this begins to make some sense, right? He says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. And that son is Jesus, right? Which brings us to our last peace. Our last piece of our worldview. Jesus is the Son of God and our Savior. Foundational. You can't have a Christ centered worldview without Christ. He has to be at the center of it. We have to adjust and base our life around Him, our attitude, our heart, our, our everything must be shaped around Jesus. Let me tie a few things together just to make this all connected. That Jesus was there at creation. He's not new to the story. He's always been just as God has been. Always. I love what Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says. Then God said, let us. Note the words there. Let us. The plurality. More than one. God's not saying, let me make. He's saying, let us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. But Jesus was there in the very beginning. He had a front row seat to the fall. He had a front row seat to all the promises and the speaking about him. And he is front and center as God's Son and Savior. Paul will say it this way in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. He says, For in him, talking about Jesus, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus. Do you, do you hear the authority? Do you hear the magnitude of the words being spoken there? So Jesus was present in the beginning and has always existed. Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Christ in the Old Testament, the Son of God who would come to save His people from their sins. The prophets spoke of Jesus, and they promised his, com his coming. And people hoped and waited until he arrived in Bethlehem to a virgin and named him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we know him as Jesus, the Son of God. And with this last piece of the foundation laid, we can begin to, begin to build our worldview based upon the truth that God has provided in Christ Jesus. And we can base our beliefs around Him, His teachings, His death, His burial, His resurrection. It's Jesus' resurrection that secures our salvation. That's why we can call Him Savior. 
His sacrifice on the cross pays the debt of sins once and for all, Scripture tells us. That He set us free, that, that in our baptism, that at our baptism, we are made new. The blood of Jesus is applied to our lives in that moment. We are forgiven and set free. Paul gives testimony to what was revealed in Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 6. He says this, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Now when somebody says that, you, you should take, your ears should turn on, right? Your, your, your brain should engage and listen to what's going to happen next. Because it's of first importance That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And after that He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters all at the same time. He is giving evidence. He is giving testimony. He is telling us that that what God promised before is taking place and unfolding right before our eyes. Jesus is alive. And God did what He said He was going to do. He has redeemed us. He has paid for us. He, he, he He has settled the debt He is in the process of restoring the relationship and giving eternal life to all who follow and obey Jesus. Now, here's what I would say. We need to allow our story to have a worldview that is written upon God's amazing grace. That His unfathomable sacrifice... Let His love and His truth be the center of our lives. These four are the foundational pieces. That God is the Creator. The fall happened and it introduced sin. That God is faithful in keeping His promises. And Jesus is the Son of God, our Savior. And the world, when you believe those things and base your world around that, it will look differently. Your worldview will be adjusted to what Scripture says speaks. There are answers found in God's truth. And we can give reason to why we believe. We can have confidence in knowing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I love what for, uh, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5. through five. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That this inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power into the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. This is my worldview based around Jesus. My glasses, my, the way I do life, the, the things that, how I would adjust my life, the, the things that I would know to hold to be true based on God's word and his love for us. Let's stand as we worship him this morning.